Well, it is 10. It's officially 7 o'clock, so we'll call this January 22nd meeting of the Waterbury Select Board to order. Um, and the first action item will be to approve the agenda. Do I have a motion? I move to approve <coughs> the agenda as presented. Second. Further discussion? Um, request an executive session at the end. Executive session at the end after next meeting agenda. Excellent. Um, we have one small change and I move to approve the <laughs> <amendment> <laughs> for the agenda. Excellent. And I second the amended. Excellent. All in favor? Aye. Aye. Any opposed or abstentions? Fantastic. We have an agenda for this evening. Uh, next would be to approve the consent agenda. I make a motion to approve the consent agenda as presented. Second. Any further discussion? Excellent. All in favor? Aye. 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 Any opposed or abstentions? Great. Consent agenda passes. Um, You'll note our chair, Roger, is not here today, um, so I will be chairing and appreciate you all being here this evening. We're moving into the section of public where you're welcome to speak on anything that's not on tonight's agenda. Um, we ask that you keep your comments to about three minutes. Should it warrant a larger discussion, we can move it to a future agenda item. Is there anyone who would like to speak from the public? Chris. Yeah, I don't know if I, I don't need to come and say it come up front there, but uh, I just wanted to say that I uh, am upset and, and completely disappointed in the fact that our state house representatives has decided to choose tonight to have an open forum town hall over at the Crossbrook Middle School on the same night that our select board meets, uh, not only for the voters here, you know, the constituents here, but also you people. You could have uh, attended that as well and maybe heard from your constituents what's concerning them at the state level, which in turn may help you out here as well. So I'm a little disappointed that they would hold a forum like that on a, on a Monday night, knowing full well that that's typically the select board night. So that's all I wanted to say. Thanks. Thanks. Alyssa? Um, as a general public announcement, there is, we're planning an event for February 10th um, from 6 to 9 p.m. at the Legion. It's a volunteer and community appreciation um, and recognition of the flooding. We're calling it What the Floods, now <laughs> two of them. Um, it's a partnership between the town, the rec committee, Rotary. Um, I'm serving as the select board rec, but just recognizing that this has been a large event for the community and we want to have um, time for folks to come together both to acknowledge and appreciate the community and all the volunteering that's happened um, and also think about what the future looks like. Um, there will be food and music and it's at the Legion with a cash bar so it's intended to be um, not all business also just a nice chance to connect with neighbors um, so everyone who's volunteered or been impacted by flooding is welcome um, and we'll be sharing it out. There is a Facebook event um, and it will also be in the Waterbury Roundabout, local press, et cetera, but just wanted to put out a save the date. So February 10th, 6 to 9 p.m., um, and hope to see folks there. Thank you. Anyone else from the public? Excellent. Thank you so much. So we'll move on, and we have um, an update from the Housing Task Force. Come on up. Welcome. Thank you. My name is Joe Kemmerer. Oh. Hi, Ann. Select board. Uh, sorry, no, one second. So, sorry, but I'm not hearing anybody on the select board. Oh, oh. thank you. She's muted. We're muted. Thank oh, you, Ann. sorry, Ann. Ann. Thank you. Thank you. <laughs> we appreciate you telling us. Okay. Now we're ready, Joe. Okay, very good. <laughs> so, hello, my name is Joe Camerata, and I'm chair of the Waterbury Housing Task Force, and thank you for the opportunity uh, to present tonight. Uh, what I'd like to do is just give a very short introduction to the task force and then talk about short-term rentals. I want to cover three topics. I want to cover the data that we have on short-term rentals, and more importantly, the data we don't have on short-term rentals. 
I like to show a comparison around how Waterbury compares to some of the other towns that are looking at this issue. And then lastly, I would like to review some policy objectives that have been drafted by the task force and then a recommendation for how to proceed. Okay. Thank you. So if we can start, Karen, if we can look at the first slide. Um, in what, the review or? Uh, no, we can just scroll down a little bit. Oh. So just in general, the task force goals are, um, are they come from the community, the 2018 community. And essentially, to summarize it, the way we look at it is what we are trying to do is look for opportunities of infill development within Waterbury, meaning that where Waterbury already has um, the infrastructure support additional housing density, what types of housing needs to be there, how much housing needs to, needs to be there. And those are the topics that we are, we are looking at. We've drafted, uh, just as a side note, in our last meeting, we drafted a list of 2023 accomplishments that I'll be circulating to the select board in the next month. Okay. Okay. Uh, the members on the task force are. Um, are the people here? Somebody. I need to move you all at home. <laughs> <laughs> okay. Um, there's actually nine members. A lot of the, a lot of them are here in, in, in attendance tonight. Uh, the four on the left-hand side were prescribed members by the ordinance, I guess it's an ordinance that was passed, and then the ones of uh, the people on the right-hand side are representing the general, general public. So in September of 2023, the task force accepted a motion in order to collect additional data on the makeup of short-term rentals in Waterbury. How many are there? And then also to collect some type of comparison of how we compare it to the nearby communities. So as I mentioned, that's what I want to go through in this presentation. The last thing about the motion was to make a recommendation on rules or regulations for the select board. That's why we're here this evening. So, but just as we start kind of a general statement on short term rentals from the housing task force, and the reasons for lack of affordable housing, or any housing actually in Waterbury, are, are complicated. You know, while short-term rentals have gained in popularity, and I'll show you data around that, the impact on the overall housing stock remains uncertain, and I'll tell you why that is. The second thing is that short-term rentals serve as a source of income, both the property owners and the tourists that they attract support the restaurants and small businesses as well. So we recognize there is an economic benefit to having short-term rentals in, in, the, in the town. But before we get too much deeper into it, let's talk about what we mean when we say short-term rental. And um, it's, a, it's definitely something that's banded around quite a bit, but for the data that we're going to look at, we mean rentals that are less than one calendar month, but we also mean rentals of a unit which are kind of a standalone housing unit, meaning they have a place to sleep, they have their own bathroom, they have some type of kitchen facility, whether it's, you know, a full kitchen or kitchenette. Um, so it could be houses, it could be apartments, it could be ADUs. What it is not, it's not a room in somebody's house that you're, you're renting out. So um, that there, are, there is data on that, but that's not what we're talking about here. So what we're talking about is, if, if you would, we're talking about rentals that could also be thought be useful from a long-term rental perspective. Okay? So that's how we define that. That's the data that we're going to be showing you, showing you this evening. This next slide is real quick. The state put out some best practices for communities that are looking at this. They kind of recommend that you do five things. You understand, you look at the data, understand the scopes and trends in your areas, set your policy objectives, look at what regulations do you have in place, and then and identify any gaps between the policy objectives and regulations. That's kind of the process that, we, that we've, we've gone through, starting with the data and working our way up from there. Okay. The executive summary, I'm gonna, I'll go through this quickly, but we're gonna talk about these in, in more detail. I mean, I think you all have known or read that short-term rental, this, is a pro, this isn't a problem that this Waterbury is talking about. It's a problem that across the, the nation, but definitely across the state, that they're up 3.6% with um, since the pandemic, and about, uh, they're up, they're, they represent 3.6 of the housing stock in the state, and it's about 37% increase since the pandemic. If you look at it for us, 
in Waterbury, there's 162 short-term rentals as of September of last year that are entire housing units. And that represents seven, that represents 7.2 percent of our households and an increase of about 57 percent from pre-pandemic levels. So if you go back to September of 2019, there was 103 units September of last year. We picked September of last year because that's the last month of which we have data. And you'll see that when we come to the next. Um, rental units, uh, rental units in Vermont towns are proposing regulations, as I mentioned. And I'm going to show you how we compare to them, but for most of those towns, that their short-term rentals, well, I should say, rentals account for less than 20% of their housing stock. So if I look at the other towns, and we'll talk about this, they have a different type of housing stock mix than we have in Waterbury. And I'm not saying it's good, it's not bad, but it does kind of explain why they're, why they're pursuing this strategy, and it's something that I think, or I would suggest that you consider as you consider how to go forward. And the last point is we have four policy recommendations and uh, four policy objectives and a recommendation on those. So let's look at the trends. And I've already kind of touched on this um, earlier, but they increased 58% since before the pandemic. So 102 units to 160 to 162 units. But just looking at that overall line, it's going in kind of one direction, except for a few years in which we had the pandemic. It's going up, right? You can just see the increase. And I wouldn't tell you that this looks any different than other towns <coughs> are facing. The slope of the line is definitely a little bit sharper on towns that are near the ski areas, um, and maybe less so the further away you get from the Green Mountains, okay? But in general, it, it overall, it's, in, it's increasing. In 2019, in 2019, the short-term rentals were 4.4 percent of our housing units, and they're now 7.2 percent. So they have increased, not just in number, but as you can imagine, because our housing stock has not increased dramatically in those years, they're now a higher percentage of the housing stock. I'm going to show you how that number, though, compares to other towns that are looking at putting in, 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 in okay? So what you would like to know, and what I would like to know, is where are those short-term rentals coming from? Are they coming from houses that were previously owned? Are they coming from long-term rentals? Or are they coming from seasonal? And the answer is, we don't know. And we don't know because those databases are disconnected. The short-term rental information comes largely from a company called AirDNA. Now, that what we're looking at has been actually taken in and, and, and um, taken into the state, brought in the housing data that we're, that's what we're pulling from. But the state pulls it from AirDNA, and over here, the housing stock is coming from this is coming from the U.S. Census Bureau. And it's not possible right now for us to say what impact is having, or where the where is coming from the housing stock. But I can talk a little bit about the housing stock and, and the makeup that we have. And it's generally, when you think about housing in an area, it fits into three buckets. It fits into owner-occupied housing, long-term rentals, and then what's called seasonal, seasonal rentals, okay? And for us, the owner-occupied housing represents 63% of, of our, our housing stock. Um, long-term rentals account for 31% of the housing stock, and keep that in mind, we'll talk about that later. And then the seasonals are about 6%. If you look at just 2016 and 2021 on that chart, the one trend that you'll see is there's been a growth in terms of the overall seasonal units. And again, I, I don't think that's necessarily coming from new houses that are being built. Um, it could be from houses that are being purchased and are made seasonal units as opposed to being owner-occupied units. But that's definitely a, a trend that we're seeing. Let's look a little bit more around what we know around the short-term rentals, okay? Um, I'm showing you data here from 2019 and 2023, but the dollar data, the financial data, we actually inflation adjusted back to the 2019 dollar. Because if you look at it, you go, wow, you know, the average monthly revenue went from 3,200 to 4,200. That's a big increase. Actually, it's not that big of an increase when you inflation just back in 2019. It's just like 10%, you know? 
But I think what I'd like you to take away from this slide is that if I was a person who owned a short-term rental in 2019, my business isn't so different in 2023, meaning that I still list it for about 25 days a month. I still have, a, you know, my average reserve days have increased just a little bit from 13 to 15. My average numbers of reservations per unit are still about five. But the total number of reservations that we see those two months have increased from 543 to 871. So where is that coming from? It's almost all coming from the new units that have been onto the market. That change of 102 up to 162, uh, right, is accounting for almost all of the total reservations. So that is both a blessing and a curse, right? It's a blessing because there are people that are coming to a lot Right, they're coming in, I mean, they're paying our property owners to stay there, they're coming to our shops, they're coming to our restaurants, right? Um, on the other hand, it's, we, it's housing that may or may not have been used in, in, in another way. And again, we, we're, still, we're still trying to, 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 to grapple that, okay? But I guess the one side to take away is that the efforts that we have in terms of proposing and, and, and marketing, if you would, Waterbury have been extremely successful because of the okay. So let's look at across the state, and this isn't, this isn't comprehensive in every town, but what I tried to do was pick those towns that have been more aggressive in terms of, of regulation and compare them to Waterbury. And we first started to compare them simply by geography, how far away were they from us, and that really didn't make much sense. What actually made much more sense was to look at them in terms of what does their housing stock look like, and does it look like the makeup of our housing stock, okay? And remember, for us, short-term rentals are 7%, long-term rentals are 31% of our housing stock. If you look at something like Killington, for example, their short-term rentals are much higher, 32%, and they have a really low number of long-term rentals. In fact, as the, as the heading says, <coughs> every one of these towns, except for Morristown, that are looking at this, their long-term rentals are less than 20% of their housing stock, right? So it's, if you would, a more immediate and urgent need that they're dealing with in terms of not having you know, long-term rentals, if indeed, they don't know any more than we do, if indeed their long-term rentals are, are, are coming at the expense of short-term rentals, okay? So that kind of gives you an idea. Um, Ludman Dairy is probably the latest. I think in December, the select board just approved an ordinance there requiring a, a registry of short-term rentals. Again, you can see how, how their housing stock compares. Karen, can we just look at the next slide? And it's just the same. Again, the only kind of one that sticks out to me here is Marstown because their short-term rentals are 6%, ours are 7 and their long-term rentals are 28 they, they look a lot like us, right, in terms of the housing stock. Yeah, um, and they have actually hmm. implemented one of the more restrictive regulations by requiring that there's only one short-term rental unit and it has to be on a primary property. One of the, I mean, again, I left the cities aside, I left Buffalo, and I left Burlington out of here, I looked more just at the towns, but it's probably the most restrictive of any of the towns that they, that, that they implement. Any questions on that? No. A couple quick questions. Yeah. Um, slide 13 had the average monthly revenue. Yes. Um, so, it, am I interpreting this correctly? If I want to know the economic impact of just the rental side, can I take that $301 daily rate, multiply by 871, and is that the is that the total business generated in the town by short-term rentals, if you will? That would have been the total number of, you would have to take the reservations mm -hmm. times the number of, you have to take the number of Days. days, right? Mm -hmm. yeah. yeah, the average reserve days per unit, which is fifteen, and times that by three hundred. Right, because the reservation could encompass five days, four exactly. days, ten days. Exactly. Yeah. yeah, and it's really important. And I, I'm sorry I didn't touch on this. Is that, but don't please don't times that by twelve. 
right? Because <coughs> September is probably the busiest month, right, that you guys. Mm -hmm. Again, I, I picked it because it was the latest data we had. We seasonally adjust it back to September of 2019. But please don't time so much. It's not an annual, it's not a yearly, it's, it doesn't hold. So, but it does hold for that. But that's almost $4 million worth of reservations in one month. So the way I think of it, too, is if we had a local option tax, it's almost $40,000 in revenue for the town in one month. Yeah. Do you have other questions? Um, yeah, it's just a quick one on slide 17. So, uh, sorry, 16, Morristown, Morristown, Morrisville. I assume they're, I would assume they grandfathered um, existing people who were renting pri prior to this? Okay. I don't. Someone behind you Someone's is nodding. Someone's shaking so your head, yes. <laughs> <laughs> yes. Okay. Thank you. That's it. Hi, Joe. Um, do we have a breakdown on out-of-state ownership of <coughs> short-term rentals? So, very, so no, very good question, right? Because what we don't is the addresses of Okay. Um, the air, the information that we get, that the state gets from air DNA is aggregated, right? Now, you could go onto the air DNA website and you can look up Waterbury and Waterbury Center. You can see red dots, and I can tell you that most of them are in the village and up in the hills of Waterbury Center. I can tell you, that, you know, um, but we don't know, and because of that, we, we can't do that trace back. Because that's my biggest concern is that. You're going to see more and more out-of-state investment taking away home ownership, <coughs> home ownership and rental opportunities right. for Airbnbs and <coughs> you know, different short term rental contracts. And that was a large, that was a big part of the discussion on the Stowe Select Board when they had this was that and it and if you look at, so London Dairy just put a registry, and I don't get too far ahead, but if you look at the way they wrote their registry, um, it, it really is driving at understanding who is doing this, mm -hmm. who is running this out. Right. Yeah. Thank you. Okay. Okay. So let's talk about the, the housing task force. Okay. So we looked over and asked <coughs> what were the policy objectives, and we had uh, a number that we reviewed, and I'll show you the ones we prioritized, and we'll talk about the ones we didn't prioritize, right? So the ones that we prioritized was, you know, maximize the availability of housing options by ensuring that limited long-term rental properties, that, so a limited number of long-term rental properties are converted into short-term rentals. So it's not that we're going to see our long-term rentals go from 31% down to 20% down to while at the same time our short-term rentals are going from 7 to 20 or something like that. So we're looking at that. Um, Michael, to get me to your point, reduce the likelihood of investors from out of the area purchasing homes for short-term rentals that would otherwise be a critical part of our local housing supply. It's, you know, also a concern. Um, you know, we feel it's important to give residents the option to utilize their properties to generate extra income from short-term rentals, as long as we're meeting the other policy objectives that are, that are associated with it. So it's not trying to... to Close that down. And then the other was, and this is getting, I guess, a little bit to what Tom alluded to, is ensure that the short term rentals are, are kind of taxed in the same way as the traditional lot lodging providers, so that we don't see a shift away from the lodging providers and the loss of those jobs, right, at the expense of short, uh, short term rentals. So they were the four objectives that the task force thought were important when it came to thinking about short term rentals. Questions on those? Oh, sorry. Let's look at the one that we did, the ones we did. <laughs> so we did it, and, and the source for these wasn't we didn't make these up. There's actually a, a lot of good information um, that you can get through the state in terms of what policy objectives to consider. So we actually used that to create those for these. Um, we didn't feel that there was an issue around party houses that were causing safety risks or noise or things like that. That wasn't. I remember really early on in the Stowe discussion, that was a big issue. Um, no one felt that that was a big issue that we had here. Um, they also didn't prioritize, you know, the other way going heavier into short-term rentals because you want to drive additional tourism, right? 
to, 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 the, to the restaurants, although it's having a big impact on that right now. And this kind of gets a little bit into some of the zoning around this, is that we didn't necessarily think that tradition, we needed to define traditional residential neighborhoods as opposed to areas where Airbnbs could be, right? It wasn't trying to restrict it geographically in the town. We just said that wasn't as important. Um, interestingly enough, we also didn't prioritize gathering information about short-term rentals, although that is our recommendation that we're going to make on the next slide. <laughs> but, but by that, we said we didn't think that gathering information is an end, end in itself. Right? If you're going to gather information, you're going to gather it for a reason. We should talk about why, okay? All right. Uh, if I could then... Oh, so this is the last slide then mm -hmm. is that we feel, and I know there was an earlier discussion at one of your meetings in December about, about this topic, right, is we should explore the development of a registry that supports collecting additional information on all types of rentals, short-term, intermediate-term, and annual rentals in the existing housing stock. And what we really think is important to know is the ownership issue. Um, you know, who owns these um, and where are, they, where are they coming from? Uh, we also think it's important to have information about what is the unit that's being rented. Is it a room? Is it an ADU? Is it a house? Because that helps us to understand a little bit around the impact it's having on housing. Is it impacting people who want to move to Waterbury who can't find an apartment? Is it impacting more people who live here and want to buy their first house but they can't because we're seeing those houses put up? So we need to understand what is being rented. And then the other is simply, what is the rental type? Is it short term, is it an annual lease, or is it somewhere in between? Remember, short term rentals kick off at 30 days, right? And the annual leases are a year. But there's some inter intermediate um, rentals that are happening in there. And then we think that we would like to be able to use that data to really come back and understand what impact is it having on the housing stock? Where is it drawing from? Because that's going to help us make better decisions about what types of housing we need to water. If it's coming from the apartment, if it's coming from people who want to have a one or two bedroom apartment, that's a different type of housing than if we're seeing it, if people are actually buying houses for short term rentals, and that's causing people who live here in apartments not to be able to buy. So it's a different type of need, but we just don't know right now. So with that, that's the end of my prepared presentation. I'd be happy to uh, take any questions. Questions from the select board? Just as a general comment, I think this is well needed, probably over, it, it's probably should have been done all, almost by now, because I think it's becoming a problem and, you know, maybe we should have done something ahead of time, but it's good that we're looking at it now. We, we need to figure out what the problem is, and, you know, I think the biggest thing, I don't want to prevent someone who has a home, maybe especially as more and more seniors, you know, look for some additional income to support as taxes get more and more. But, you know, I think as the town manager said, it, it could be a good way for, you know, for our local options tax, because if there are, it is more of a lodging kind of thing that the town may, may want to benefit in some way, shape, or form. So without having a registry, we don't, we don't just don't know. Joe, I would just like to thank you for all the work you and the housing task force have done on this. This is a, a very well done presentation, and this is the fact that you've mulled over hundreds of pages of data mm -hmm. to get <laughs> to get all this information is not lost on me. Other questions? Yeah. Oh. Sorry, Mike, I'm going to let... That's okay. Yes, could you come on up for and to state your name? Uh, Cheryl Fuller. Thanks, Cheryl. Um, so, question, you talked about existing housing stock. Um, <coughs> is there going to be some kind of recommendations on people just buying land and building a house specifically for a short-term rental? I'm asking because there are some already in town that are specific for that. They're, they're houses. They're... they're um, I know the legislature is working on a new uh, way that people will be able to build with less active 50 influence. Mm -hmm. I can see that having an impact on the land that we have surrounding us. We're our village. We don't want to get too many people buying up that land and then having it turned into something that's going to be really messy. 
So are you guys looking at not just existing, but future? How we would register people who want to purchase land and maybe just do that and not as a house? Yeah, that's a good question. We talked about the existing housing stock, <coughs> um, but the, the registry, this recommendation would be for anyone who's having short-term rentals. And I think you're right. We've also talked about you know, the new proposed zoning regulations and increasing density in the village. You know, I mean, they're being proposed so that we can increase the housing stock here. What would happen if, you know, 100% of those were just made into short-term rentals? We, what would we have gained? I mean, gain related tourism, but we wouldn't have gained what we hope to gain in terms of passing, uh, increasing our density. So it wouldn't be for just existing, it would be for anyone who was, who was going to do that. And then we, as a town, would be able to say, we're at a capacity on short-term rentals, not gonna happen. Like, what I'm asking is, can someone just come in and buy up five acres of land and then decide that they've decided, hey, it's my, my property, I'm gonna do a short-term rental. I'm not existing housing stock, I'm building new housing stock. Your zoning is gonna allow it, so, so mm -hmm. thanks very much, but I'll do it a lot. I'm just something to think about as you guys are coming up with. Yeah, and so the first step before the, any policies that would either put a moratorium or a limitation is the registry, and then we get to make those decisions going forward like the other towns have, because it's important to keep in mind. Mike, you have more? Yeah. <clears throat> did the Vermont State Housing Authority, a number of years ago, didn't they create a statewide housing registry for rental housing? Like it made it into the final I legislative know, proposal I don't, I don't that was signed. It finally went through. But I know exactly. that was what talked was. about, because right. if it is, and I think that was more not geared, it was more before this whole short-term rental, I think it was more geared for a registry for tradi more traditional rental housing. Mm -hmm. But that might have some information, because a lot of those traditional rental housings could have converted to short-term. don't short have term. anything on the, on the traditional rental housing. Market. Um, I don't think anything ever came of that. Yeah, yeah I know it was being yeah. mulled about, and I don't know if it ever came about, but... I only know of the one for lodging because they collect it. Right. Mm -hmm. right. right. So, uh, really big Thank you. Jill, um, when these other towns have put the regulations in place, is it a rental regulation? Is it interleaved into the zoning regulations? And if it's in the zoning regulations, you just plop it in, you don't have to muck with everything else you've done. I mean, how does it, how does it actually get implemented once you know how you want to regulate? So, the first thing I would say is that if you look at, at the list, outside of Morrisville and uh, one town that has a moratorium, most of them haven't done anything yet around it. Right? Most of them are exactly where we are, where the recommendation is, let's have a registry so we, we understand what's happening and where it's happening now, right? But if you go a little deeper and kind of listen to the discussions, there's at least you know, one or two towns which have talked about it from a zoning perspective, saying there's parts of towns that should have short-term rentals, and there's parts of towns that should not be allowed to have short-term rentals. Yeah. Yeah, so. But nothing's been improved as far as that. Oh, Billy, it's, um, you have your choice in this one. You can do it either way. You can do a freestanding ordinance if you were going to regulate short-term rentals, or you can do it to the zoning side. I just wanted to clarify, Joe, on the recommendation around um, if this covers both short-term rentals and long-term rentals, because I know that's something we discussed. Because yeah. we don't really know where that housing stock is either. So. Right, right. That's so right. just to state, so this is intended, this recommendation is intended to cover both. To cover both, yes. Chris? Yeah, has there been any, any discussion during your meetings about uh, what's driving the short-term rentals? Obviously, it's it's a better income source in a lot of cases. Uh, I'm in the construction industry and I see what goes on out there. I see people actually building two homes, one for themselves and then a small unit for Airbnb to help afford the house. And people are putting apartments over garages, their Airbnb and those out. Um, if your goal is to try to create more long-term rental units by s trying to squeeze on the short terms. Uh, has there been any discussion about, and I know this is a state issue, mm -hmm. landlord and tenant regulations, which 
from what I understand, lean heavily towards the tenant. That's why people are getting away from the long-term rentals, because they don't want to take the risk of being stuck with somebody who doesn't want to pay the rent and essentially have a very costly process of getting them out. Mm -hmm. uh, has, has there any, been any discussion as to how that plays into this whole mix? I mean, Chris, well, the best we know is the anecdotal information. And I would say that on the side of short-term rentals, the major argument in the computer is exactly what you said, that long-term rentals are risky and they're cumbersome, right? You know, to, to, to do. On the other hand, we have a lot of people that do, that do long-term rentals that, that matter, right? You know, um, so that's what we usually hear. And then for short-term rentals, it's, you know, what we usually hear in favor of the short-term rentals is that if you didn't allow me to short-term rental that unit, I would just call it one because it might be a house that my family uses when they come to visit or a room, and they're using it four or five weeks a year. But in the other year, they never use it. And they're not, it's not always on, when they be on the market. It's like seasonally on the market. So that's what you hear kind of on both sides. But we haven't done a survey. We've talked to people and kind of go to that. I mean, that's one of the things that I'm also seeing is that people from out of town, out of state, are coming in, they're purchasing these homes as second homes, and that's how they're financing them, paying for, paying for them, and it's really short term. I have a and, and, and they use, you know, they, they got themselves slotted in when they want to come in, but it's it's an investment for them, you know, it's a, it's a way of playing a different kind of stock market, you know. But Tom, I have a question. Wouldn't we be able to look at the grand list and look at the transactions in the last two years and understand who's buying here? So we can we can see who buys based on the land records. Um, yeah, so we can we can dig a detailed dive if we knew exactly which units, and we could see if that was essentially built for a short term rental. But we need the addresses. Yeah, and then no, it's would we know which assuming. which units say exchanged hands in the last <coughs> couple of years and be able to look at right yeah. who right who owns it. Now, what it doesn't tell us is if someone comes in and sets up a local LLC and they're out-of-state investors. And that's why I said I recommend looking at the Londonderry um, regulation because that goes actually much deeper. It says if you're a corporation, you've got to list your principal owners and your addresses because they're trying to, mm -hmm. to, to get through mm -hmm. that. We wouldn't know that from the grant, but we'd be able to tell if it's out-of-state or people that are you know, in-state or in-town. Yeah. Sure. Good. May I? May I? Yeah, okay. um, the PTTR, which is one of the documents <coughs> recorded, does say whether it's your primary dwelling or not. Right. Yeah. So there is some indication in the transfer whether they're moving here from Connecticut or wherever, yeah. um, or whether they're buying it as a second home. Right. It, it does say that on that document. Thank you, Joe. So it seems like our next step will be to take these recommendations into consideration, adding them to another a future agenda, and then discuss and move forward. Okay. So we appreciate you on the task force work a lot. Okay. Thank you so much. Thank you. <laughs> All right. And next we have a CV Fiber update. Chris is here. Excellent, Chris. Come on up. Thank you. Um, so I don't have a prepared update for what's going on with CV Fiber. I mean, the, the short version is that, you know, we're not at Water Waterbury yet. Um, that would probably be another year or so. Um, but there are details on the website if anybody wants any specific updates. But the reason I'm here tonight is that um, Linda Gravel, um, who has been our delegate um, for the past few years and has been doing a fantastic job, um, is wants to step back and spend less time on CV Fiber, especially with the elections coming up. We all know how busy she is and how involved she is in those. Um, and so um, we we're asking if I can become the, the primary delegate and she would become the alternate. At least until the election cycle. Right. Questions from the select board or? Chris has participated and I'm very comfortable with the change. Okay. It's pretty straightforward. Excellent. So then I would entertain a motion. Um, I move to authorize Chris Schenk as the full Waterbury delegate to the CV 
fiber governing board from the period from January 2024 through April 2024 or until the annual elections for May 2024 in place of Linda Gravel, who will be our alternate, and to ask the town clerk to please send a letter authorizing this swap to the CB Fiber Executive Director. <laughs> Moved and seconded. Any further discussion? Thank you to you, Chris, and to Linda for spending so much of your volunteer time doing this. And I will say, just so folks know, like, if you want to give the three-second club, CV Fiber is like on the ground in <coughs> communities in yeah. Vermont providing internet. That's happening. Yes. Yes. Um, yeah. For for more details, please go to cvfiber.net. Um, but it is a uh, an active live um, internet provider now. Um, I think we have 76, <laughs> um, but we've, um, we've passed something like 1,500 um, different addresses, and uh, there, you can actually see all of the towns that, we're, that we are uh, serving currently and what is next up, and it kind of looks like a donut, really weird looking donut, but it's a, a, a big circle, and, um, and we started in um, um, Calus, and we're kind of moving around the ring like this. And uh, and so we're you know kind of going in, in both directions at the same time. And Waterbury is you know is is coming up on on the western side of that ring. Um, but we have pricing information, and you can put in your address and uh, and get notified if anybody wants information about Wayne Hill App Service. And and we are focusing on even though we've passed you know something like fifteen hundred addresses, um, the focus is on uh, first providing service to those who have no service or have very limited service. Um, that is our, our primary um, customer base, and that's what we're focusing on. And, and once those customers are served, we are going back to, to serve everybody. So even if you do have Comcast or, or you know consolidated, and you know your speeds are okay, but you want to work with a local company um, that is a not-for-profit company, and the more uh, people we serve, the lower our prices will get uh, because we will be operated like a municipality. So. Um, yeah, go to our website and find out more. Thank you. You said it was cvfiber.net. cvfiber.net, yes. We have a motion. Oh, yes. <coughs> do you, further discussion before we vote? Or <laughs> Just some, I, I forgot we hadn't voted yet. Yeah, okay. All in favor? Aye. 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 Any opposed or abstentions? The motion passes. Thank you so much. Very and Mike, welcome. you wanted to add? I do have a question for Chris. <laughs> um, I was exhibiting this weekend at the Champlain Valley Fair. And one of the exhibitors at the fair was that they had a big banner, local local fiber internet. Yes. Uh, they were Fidium. <laughs> okay, yes. You, uh, that's consolidated. Oh, that's consolidated. Yes. Okay. That, now I know. <laughs> but there, there are there are um, additional companies like us um, right. that, uh, that are, um, uh, CUDs or communication union districts that are actual not-for-profit companies um, that are and like us to the area that provide service. Yes, in different areas, and, and CB Fiber is the one serving mostly Washington County. It's right. not quite as you know straightforward as that, um, but but yes, and and we will be actually we already are setting up you know things events like that at little local fairs and, and things. And, and one will be coming to Waterbury once we are serving uh, Waterbury. Okay, thanks. Thanks, Chris. Thank you very much. Yeah, have a good night. And we'll move for the budget, starting with the Senior Center. Take it away, Tom. Right? <laughs> oh, hello. Thank you for coming. Oh, okay. We are asking for the same amount. Can you introduce yourself for mm -hmm. the? Can you introduce yourself oh, for us before we get started? That's okay. Sorry, I'm Maureen White. Thanks, I'm Maureen. The board treasurer for the Waterbury Senior Center. It's okay. Um, so we're asking for the same amount as last year, thirty-nine thousand. Um, we served fifteen thousand one hundred and sixty-nine meals to Waterbury residents last year, maybe for the year ending September thirtieth, which is our fiscal year. Most of that is uh, meals delivered to homebound uh, seniors. Uh, some of it was in our, our congregate dining room. So, and that's up, up about 6% over the prior year. Um, our budget this year, I did send you copies of it, um, is up about 4%. We 
which is mostly uh, wage increase and also food increase, but everything else kind of stayed the same. So the new thing this year, uh, the reason why we can keep our funding request the same, is we're getting extra money from the state this year. Um, the state legislature added a million dollars to the state budget for senior meals, um, and it passed. So we're getting an extra 84 cents a meal, which doesn't sound like a lot, but it adds up. So that's an extra $15,000 in revenue in our budget. So because of that, we can keep everything kind of the same, even though we now have you know increased costs and increased meals, and you know the number of meal requests kind of go up and down depending on. Um, so um, there's that, and the other thing I want to mention to you is that last time I was here, we talked about our aging dishwasher. Um, I just want to tell you that we applied for uh, a grant from the Vermont Department of Buildings and General Services, the Building Communities Grant, and we applied for it for a dishwasher, and we got it. Yeah. And it required a one-to-one -one match for fundraising, which we did, and we got a new dishwasher in December 7th. That's great news. Excited. excited to do that. So. Fewer expenses uh, for that. So. Um, I don't have anything else to report. We did have another successful uh, financial review. Uh, fiscal year ending 22 came back clean. There were no changes to our books. So we do have an outside auditor looking at our books every year. They'll do a full audit every three years, and then in between they'll do a review, which is like one step down. So um, we're proud of that. So um, do you have any questions? What's the status of the full renovation of the kitchen? <laughs> the person who's going to sit right here is going to explain that to you. So we went through, we got the <coughs> plans from, or from NEFTAC, and um, as it turned out, Downstreet will not approve it. Um, Downstreet, about two and a half years ago, did a building renovation that it was, it was a huge renovation, and they got a lot of tax credits because of that. And so they can't make any changes to the building. Mm. So for another two and a half years, um, we can't put a hole in the wall. We can't do anything. So we're kind of stuck. Um, we've also been trying to get a hold of the state fire marshal to tell us you know, what's, you know, what can we do. And we're not getting a response. Mm -hmm. So we're, we've spent the money that you gave us from the ARPA funds, but we of stuck. Um, I was hoping Justin would come and explain more of that to you, but as far as I understand it, we're, there's nothing we can do. So I don't know what happens to the funds. If I have to get it back, I, we will. <coughs> I know all too much about tax credit, so yeah. I yeah. so yeah. someone understand. Mm -hmm. I'm really sorry to say we've been asking the street first, but we, mm -hmm. so we shouldn't. Okay. Um, I guess this is Maybe your friend could have answered. Um, NEFTEC, it's a fire suppression system, right? Mm -hmm. uh, or is it your whole hood vent? That's the whole hood vent. It's the yeah, whole hood vent. Yeah. They do all the plans, and they have a yeah. the whole thing worked out. Mm -hmm. Instead of going out side, they go out the back or something. Um, so we did We did spend the 10551 that you gave us um, for the plans and for everything. And we were all set to come and ask for town permits. <coughs> Downstreet mixed it. Tom. No, I just want to say you're not you're not the first group to get <laughs> stuck in the morass of tax credits mm -hmm. and historic buildings, and you won't be the last. Yeah. Do we have to get money back? Or? That's not up to me. <laughs> <laughs> I think you know we'll keep uh, open communication with ongoing, and then if there is anything, I mean, it sounds like there's pretty tight constraints, but if there's contact we can help with or those kinds of requests you know reach out to us or to tom and just keep uh plugging away <laughs> i don't he did John, he did say that like that, that period that they couldn't do any work was only five years mm -hmm. so you know there is a possibility that two more years that we could do some work so. and the plans wouldn't change so you have those so. and be ready for when you could mm -hmm. it's you still need it we still need the fire suppression system we still have to, we just can't Other questions? Very silly regulations. <laughs> Federal money. Um, okay, thank you so much. Thank you. We don't need to do anything, right? No action. <laughs> Triple check.
Yeah, the, the big question about the senior center with no funding increases last year, we had a discussion about how much of it is in the budget right. versus the warning, so we can revisit that later. Okay. And library budgets. <coughs> Hello. Hi, everyone. I'm Dan King. I'm the chair of the Library Commission. Um, and my fellow commissioners are also here with me. Um, um, so overall, the library budget this year, there's sort of a two-fold um, discussion tonight. Um, with the budget, there was not a lot of increases in a lot of the different slots, the, the overall picture, but there was a few um, portions that had large increases. One being the health insurance for existing employees, which we have absolutely no control over. Um, people choose different plans and they pay different amounts based on what they choose and that is entirely up to them. Um, but the other thing that we wanted to increase this year was the regular pay, um, and that is sort of where um, we're trying to fix some of the inequities in the pay that we have um, been um, that have been brought to our attention more recently, um, and <coughs> so the commission in our discussions we had um, in prior years been contributing thirty thousand dollars from the library trust, and in the budget that Tom proposed um, we wanted to bring it up to forty five thousand dollars, and that is sort of where the commission ran into a bit of a discussion with whether or not that would, was agreed upon. Um, we all agree that the increases in the library pay are necessary and um, absolutely warranted, especially when compared to other libraries in the surrounding areas. Um, and I can get into that in more detail. I don't know if that would warrant an executive session on employee salaries or not. But on the side of the trust in particular, um, I just wanted to bring up that um, in, if going with an increase of the $45,000 or up to forty five, so it's an extra $15,000, um, I was looking at it as um, from the idea of if we look at the earnings for a year of last October to this October, if we did that full $45,000, that's taking about 90% of the earnings from the trust. And I, the, the commissioners are not as comfortable with taking that large amount out of the trust. Um, and also the trust has been, the contributions that the trust has been, that we've been using it for in the past years have been increasing quite dramatically over the last few years. In 2020 it was at 14,000, 2021 it went up to 26,000, and then in 2022 it went up to 30,000. Um, so then now 2024 we go up to 45. Um, and we just want to be mindful of that money, <coughs> keeping it for future use and making sure that it still has enough keeping uh, from the earnings that are going back into it so that we can keep it growing and continue to use it in many years to come for the benefit of the library and the benefit of the town and um, all the people in it because the library does so much for all of us and we really are so lucky to have a, a beautiful library with really great staff and they do awesome programming and have a nice collection for, for Vermont and the t size of town that we have and really couldn't ask for, for, for better people in it and that's the real thing is that the people are the asset when it comes to the library. They are controlling the collection and the programming and the atmosphere and without them it's just a, a building with books in it but they bring the life to it. So we certainly deserve to have adequate I guess that's the start of my spiel. <laughs> Does anybody have any questions to go on? Mike. I'm a fiscal conservative, which I am. Mm -hmm. uh, but why do you feel that it's not it's not appropriate to take money from the trust fund to help balance some of your salary and inequities? Um, I think we do. So we're happy with the thirty thousand. It's the going up the right. additional fifteen that's causing. Uh, giving us pause because we don't want to set the precedent that we're going to be giving 90% of the trust away every year um, necessarily 90, 90%. of the earnings. Oh, okay. Mm -hmm. um, and that it has gone up quite a bit recently in the last, you know, since 2020. It's gone up quite sufficiently. The, the trust balance is what? Uh, the, the trust has about $600,000. And so the, the budget where we're at today, which has about a 
three and a half percent tax increase has thirty thousand in the budget, not the forty five. Okay. Um, I didn't put the forty five in because the library commissioners control the trust, so you can you cannot tell them to put more money from the trust in the budget, but you control every other line item in the budget. Okay. And and on my conversation with the library commissioners, what I said is. No, the trust at 600K is a pretty healthy amount, and you have a trust for a lot of reasons, um, and oftentimes they're started with one large donation. Um, but, the, but oftentimes trusts are used for things like big capital projects. That's probably the most common reason why you try to build a trust. And I thought with none in front of us in the foreseeable future, because we've got a really nice new building, the, the big challenge of today is finding and retaining employees. And so I thought if we can, for one year, bump up the trust to help us get over that, that payroll bump um, for one year. So essentially the trust going from 30 to 45 covers just about half of the salary and, and then you know the FICA that goes with that. Um, with the plan that we go back to the 30 mm. in future years. I agree with Tom's analysis. <laughs> I, I'm kind of really questioning as to if, if you're not foreseeing something that you're going to need as a big spending program, why can't you take that money out of <coughs> that extra $15,000 out of the trust? Um, I know it's a commissioner kind of thing, but sure. you, know, uh, you know, we're also looking at the whole health of the whole community. And you know, when there's a big healthy amount, I look at that as, you know, well, Maybe that should be spent. Yeah, I mean, the money is for the benefit of the library, and I think spending money to 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 provide for the budget is certainly a, a good use of it. Um, I'll say that there were differing opinions on the commission at different points too, um, and that I think if there was a some sort of agreement that was written that said that it wouldn't be going forward, and that might have assuaged some of the, um, I guess, wariness of some of the commissioners. They just do Like a one-year bump or something. Right. Um, just saying that it's not forever, that it would just be for one year, and then we could come and be back here again next year and come up with something else. Um, but they didn't want to just give it away without asking first, because why not? And it is only $15,000, which in the grand scheme of the town budget isn't <coughs> that much. <laughs> Um, Tom, did you? Oh, sorry. Tom, did you say one year? Or did you say two or three years? Or you didn't? So did you have something in mind? I have in mind one year. Mm -hmm. to, to, I thought of it as about the, the fifteen thousand dollars would cover about half of the payroll increase. So the ta the town taxpayer would pay half. The trust would pay the half to to smooth the impact of it. Um, and I guess if you assume for a minute the 2024 budget has the payroll increase and has the extra money from the trust, if we look ahead one year, um, the library commissioners, assume the library commissioners say $30,000 from the trust, um, if the board were uncomfortable, we, we then would have to go backwards on other expenses and cut the budget in other ways. And there's no real way to do that in the library budget. Um, because really the money is in personnel. Um, I don't think we do that. I don't think we're gonna be in a position where that has to happen. I think that'd be a pretty harsh decision to make. So I think in a way, um, they're the guarantee um, of that. Um, so I think, I think it's very possible. Um, and I get, there's different ways to look at $15,000. One way is, you know, it's not a lot of money, but Bill Woodruff with like an extra 15 grand in his budget, and, and so would Katarina and, and everyone else. Um, and 1% on the tax rate is about 45 grand, um, so it's about a third of a percent. Um, so it all adds up, it's all part of the big picture. Um, you know, something I've, I've heard about the budget um, from a few people on the select board, and I guess the sentiment I get from the community is, and the sentiment I get from talking to other towns is that Towns are feeling a lot of pressure, right or, right or wrong, because of what's coming with school taxes. Mm -hmm. um, and so 
you know, it depends about your comfort with the tax rate. Mm -hmm. Roger, thank you. Danny? Oh, hi, Roger. Uh, yeah, Danny, thanks. Um, yeah, uh, I am particularly concerned that we are facing a, uh, a substantial increase uh, in taxes due to the education budget. Um, and um, so if the library commissioners are, are okay with putting this off, this increase off for a year, um, I guess, you know, we would, would might be okay with that, but, uh, you know, we're, my sense is that uh, they're, they're not interested in putting their contribution forward. Um, so, um, you know, I guess that's the question is, is that the message that we're getting from the library commission? You mean that either it would come from the town budget or it would not increase this year? The, yeah, I'm not interested in increasing the town budget uh, any more than, than we need to. Uh, and uh, my sense is that the library commission has the money. Uh, they're not interested in spending the additional 15,000. Uh, so are they comfortable with putting this off, this increase off for, for the next year? Um, one more question. I know there are a couple of hands in the public, and I'm sorry, um, but just for clarification, so if it were to come from the trust this year and then we said it was only one year, the, the idea would be that it would then be put into the town budget in the next year or finding some balance in additional revenue? Um, or what are the thoughts? The idea would be next year the library would go back to standard increases for everyone else right. that we get over the hump. Mm -hmm. Okay. And some mm -hmm. questions were from the public, Bill. <laughs> yeah, come on up. Bill. Sorry. Yeah. Thank you. Um, just a couple of things and obviously I worked with the library commissioners for a long time. Um, and I understand the reluctance of the library commissioners to give too much from the trust, but I also understand the select board and the manager saying that maybe this is a time that we can that we can do it. Uh, I appreciate your statement about what the trust did from October to October, but your budget is a uh, annual budget that runs from January first to December thirty first. Um, through November, the the trust fund, it's um, uh, increase in the trust and the interest through November, December's gains haven't even been posted yet, was $81,100. Um, the stock market did quite well in November and December. That was January through November, Bill? Sorry that to clarify. Thank you. Um, so far, only 21000 of the 30 that was budgeted last year has been transferred from the trust to the to the general operating fund. And I'll talk to Tom tomorrow or sometime why that nine thousand dollars hasn't gone yet. Because it already was there. No. Through the other donations through the Jocelyn and Allen Trust. Right. I think that's incorrect though I can show you later. The the Jocelyn and Howlin trusts are beneficiary revenue to the fund sixteen, the trust fund. And then the trust fund makes the, 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 and I just looked at it before I came in to this meeting, so I'm confident I'm correct. Anyway, um, so right now, 81,000 was gained, 21,000 has been given from last year. Uh, so through November, the trust is worth about $618,000. And when the December numbers are posted, it's going, going to be higher. Um, I think the commissioners should talk about a policy going forward that would be pretty simple. I, um, we used to have a policy, in fact, it may be considered still on the books, and it was a complicated formula that I had worked with those trustees or those commissioners with, and it took a percentage of the gain and so on and so forth. But the trust is getting to the point now that it's it's much heftier than it was 15 years or so ago when it was in the $300,000 range. And maybe they should say, you know, 4% a year, 5% a year of the ending value of the trust should be turned over. 
And in good years, when the market goes up a lot, the 5% will be, uh, you know, a higher amount in bad years. Uh, when the trust maybe even goes down, taking 5% of a lower level will be a, a smaller, a smaller withdrawal. And, and then, you know, over time, uh, you hope the stock market will rebound. I want to just let you know that I've done some research. I support the library very, very strongly. I think if you go back and look at the things that I tried to do while I was here, was to really build the library up to the best of our ability. But when you look at what we pay for a library compared to surrounding communities, I read the, the Times Argus on January 5th when they introduced their new director and uh, the Aldrich Library in Barry. Barry City contributes $250,000 a year and Barry Town $200,000 a year. Last year we contributed $513,000 in 2023. Um, the Aldrich Library in Montpelier, um, there's five towns, Montpelier, East Montpelier, Berlin, Middlesex, and Calais. Montpelier pays in 2023, 411,775. And this year, um, it looks like they're they're going to go up to um, about. I had it over here. Um, they were at 411,774 last year, and they're going up to 444,700. So at 513, um, you know it's. It's uh, what eighty thousand dollars more than Montpelier is contributing to their library. I believe Montpelier is a different funding structure well, than our. I, I understand it's a. I understand it's a different funding structure, but this the taxpayers in that community are paying that amount, and I've tried to look at this a lot of different ways. Um, East Montpelier pays forty six thousand seven hundred dollars to that library, Berlin. 34,000, Middlesex 32,000, and Calus 29,000. Now those communities don't have the library in their town, so I understand that a little bit. But if you look at uh, tax effort, and, and you know, Montpelier's grand list is almost $13 million, equalized grand list last year. And they're paying three cents, 3.2 cents of a tax rate to support the $411,000. Barry City has a uh, uh, six million six hundred thousand dollar grant. I'm not sure what to do. They're paying three point eight cents. I, I hear you, Bill. I and guess. And Waterbury is paying four cents, four point three cents last year. So I'm just letting you know that I think that Waterbury is strongly supports its library, uh, and I think that given all those circumstances, that you know. A, a couple of weeks ago, I thought Tom's proposal was forty thousand dollars, and maybe it's forty-five now. But I think this is a year, given everything that is going on, um, that you should consider making that larger contribution. Thank you very much. Yeah, Alyssa. I guess I'll say as a select board member, thank you. My two concerns, I think if we're paying employees in town inequitably, I want to make sure that's corrected. So just to say, I think it's our responsibility as a select board if folks are not being paid in line with folks in surrounding communities, as we just heard an extensive comparison to other communities, you also can commute to work in another community. So I just think we need to be mindful of making sure we're that support. I guess I'm interested in terms of your conversation. As a select board member, I'm also struck with that we're in these seats today and trying to recognize what is a one-time circumstance and what's a long-term policy. I'll say there's some situations we've had where we're not putting as much into reserve funds. And personally, I love funding reserve funds because I think they're important for rainy days. And, and I'm willing to make that concession this year because I think there are some one-time expenses. Um, so I guess I was interested to hear that. I also recognize this is the first time we're having a dialogue. So I think as boards, you know, ultimately we're all trying to serve the community. You all are elected library trustees, also trying to be good stewards. Um, and I just want to be mindful of the dynamics between the boards. So I was interested in your point around if there was a one-year assurance or an agreement for next year, if that might potentially 
be useful to folks and if there's a way to look towards that, just wanting to be mindful of getting us all to the same end goal of supporting the library in a way that feels fair to all. Yes, I think that would be um, helpful to the commission and I think that's <laughs> it's not a meeting. If you'd like to come forward, feel free. Thank you. Oh, yes. You can, but it's physically. Yeah. A couple of things to, to add. Thank you. Um, Could you introduce yourself? I'm Margaret Moreland, and I'm one of the library commissioners. Um, these are some of the highlights, by the way, things that were accomplished over the last year by the library, in addition to everything that it usually does. Um, and just to correct one thing, the um, Montpelier Library is not a municipal library. It's a, Rachel knows this. It's an incorporated library. Uh, that means that more of its budget does come from fundraising and endowment as opposed to being built as a town department as this um, so, one thing I wanted to say is that our contribution <coughs> since 2020 has already increased by 100%. And 2020, we were uh, contributing $14,255. The library budget has increased by 10% because the library is doing a lot more than it has ever done before. Um, this is at a time where the inflation rate is 20%. So it's not really out of line with what's going on. In fact, it's very conservative. Um, we've also increased the money that we've gotten from other sources so that we can do programs. Um, and most of all, what I want to say is that the library employees are town employees. The difference in the average salary is horrendous. Uh, and that's not just within other libraries nearby. That's also <coughs> within the town and the town employees. Right. There's a, I don't know, can I say what the difference is? So <laughs> we can have an executive session later and I can I could go over some of the comparisons I did using names, and that's a, okay. that's a part of it. Mm -hmm. Okay. But I was personally shocked that this has been going on for years, and these are not library employees only. These are town employees. So why shouldn't they be getting a fair salary? And why should the trust fund bear the responsibility for that when we've constantly been increasing what we've been accomplishing and what we've been contributing. We have contributed in the past to, um, for instance, when there was a new, um, a new server was needed for the town, library contributed half of that money. So we contributed a lot to the building of this <coughs> building. But the trust comes from money that was given to us to manage as a trust. And there's a trust document, and it's, it sets up the standard that we should be physically conservative, and um, I don't remember the exact word. <laughs> thank you. So before I want to- Michelle is also on the board. Yeah, so. thank you, Michelle. Uh, two seconds. I just want to ask Tom just procedurally and like what our goals are for this evening in particular and make sure that we're supporting conversation to help move us forward now and then put on, you know, a future docket, like a future decisions and actions. So can you clarify so, what our goal is for this evening in particular? So the decision that has to be made is about the overall library budget. And mm -hmm. if you would, at a current tax increase of about 3.5%, would you support the library budget with that tax increase or would you want to return the library to the standard 4% that's budgeted for every other department, um, which would take a little over 20 grand out of their budget. Um, so that, that's effectively the decision. Um, if you, you know, 
if you tell the commissioners you don't support the increases without their 15, with the extra 15, I suspect they would have another meeting and, and make a different make a decision. If you're if you're okay at 30 grand from the library with the salaries with our tax rate, then I think we're all okay. I would um, amend that slightly. I think in my mind it's whether or not you require us to provide the 30,000 or the 45, because if we have to, we will. But. We <coughs> We didn't want to go forward with that as the first offer, I'm going to say. The, um, another statistic uh, is that uh, the amount the library has received from taxes has only increased 6% since 2020. While obviously inflation is more, but um, we're already uh, using more <coughs> of our money, or we're using it better. So that shouldn't make it a penalty. And these are town employees who are paid grossly different rates. Thank you. Then I want to let Michelle speak as well, Margaret. Thank you so much. Sorry, um, I just wanted I. <laughs> Support, we, the commissioner, support bringing the library um, up to the market level of um, wages. Um, one of our hesitancies of doing that with the trust is that um, the pressures on the library budget this year are all about um, the wages and the health insurance. So the trust in using one-time monies to support an ongoing expense um, just seems to be a bit of a mismatch. So, you know, like it's been mentioned, we supported a serve or kind of a one-time expense in the past. So that is um, also a piece of um, how we we're feeling about this and maybe wanting some assurance about it being a bridge mm -hmm. um, for a limited period of time. Just because of the nature of this is an ongoing expense for the and that was sort of my question to you, Tom, is that it won't change, you know, next year. So the money will need to come from somewhere next from year. Somewhere next year. So we're baking Kicking the can. 25 budget. Mm -hmm. Right. $15,000 increase. Right. Else. Versus having to go back and do it now yeah. where we've come so far. Um, is there a way that is more than just the board who's here, which will be a different board next year, to tell the commissioners a handshake or something in writing or, you know, we're going to do this next year or is it really just a, you know? It's really a, I, I think it's really a handshake. Mm -hmm. um, you know, you can't pass a law. Right. I mean, that could be amended by the, by the boards. Um, it really boils down to a handshake. And, and if I may just take a second. Thank um, you. So when I, when I started the budget, um, just to give a little context, um, I try to be careful not to impact any one department because of something occurring in another um, at, a, at a parity to everyone. So I try to approach it through that lens, number one. Number two, um, you know, I didn't, I didn't structure the, the craft budget to cause some opposition here. Um, but the money has to come from somewhere. And so I thought this was, this was just a logical way to go about it. And I also want to say I've had bunch of conversations with Diana and Rachel and the other library board members, and they're not wrong. It, and I don't think I'm wrong either, and that's the challenge here. <laughs> <laughs> it's not that it's, they're not wrong, and they're extraordinarily thoughtful, and they're protecting their trust, which is their job. Um, and so um, they've been good, productive conversations, and I really appreciate those conversations. I was just trying to find a logical way to an endpoint and, and trying to manage the whole. And, and that's all. So I'm not sure if I succeeded at that or not. Um, <laughs> Roger, go ahead. Thank you. Yeah, uh, thanks, Tom, and thanks to everyone. Uh, I mean, we obviously can't give a guarantee, but I think our intention is uh, to try to uh, engage with the commissioners to get, over, get us over the hump. Unfortunately, this is not the only budget increase that we're facing. Um, and uh, you know, 
know, personally, I'm, I'm willing to make the commitment to get this back down to previous levels in coming years if I happen to be reelected. <laughs> um, and uh, we're just looking for some support. You've had uh, a fairly good year in terms of investments, and we're just hoping that you will make the decision to, to help us get through this impasse. So I'd like to, in the interest of a uh, ending on a good note and having productive conversation, not um, going too far down a path we don't need to, but also coming to some, some good conclusions. What is the board, does the board need more conversation? Do you feel ready to move forward with uh, decision making? I would like to interject to Tom's comment about uh, a few comments ago, because this has been a long discussion, <laughs> um, about <coughs> spending more of the town budget on the library at the expense of the other departments. And when it comes to equalizing wages, I, I guess I don't see it as an expense to the other departments, more as something that should have already happened. And so no one's taking any cuts in a sense where now our wages are equal, right? No one's, we're not ripping raises out of anybody's hands to give them to somebody else, right? It's, we're just bringing everyone to the equal level. And I understand our budget restraints, and I understand that the trust may have to contribute to this as well. <laughs> but there definitely is a common ground between them using more of the trust than they're comfortable with and us spending more money than we're comfortable with. If we can find an equal, like an <clears throat> equalization between our spending and the trust spending, I think that's gonna make everyone in the room happy. Do you have something to add? I can tell if you're raising your hand. Uh, no, I just, I would echo the same sentiments of like, personally, I don't wanna cut other line items. That's just not how I, as an elected official, wanna make budgets. I don't think that's neighborly or in good faith to the community. I also think we're trying to, again, balance competing needs. So I, I, in terms of deliberation, I guess the question is, is there a way to revisit this with the commissioners? And I guess, I, Michelle, I do have one question. Of, I, I hear you around the trust and the one-time expenses. I will say, honestly, the most interesting piece of news for me tonight is that this would be only on earnings from this year. I guess I would say, like, we had conversations about a different trust fund, and I'm not making an analogy, and I know they're different, but when you're cutting into the principal, I, I really, like, just personally, viscerally, hear, like, see that need to be protective. If, if you're able to make a bigger one-year contribution out of earnings that are just from this year, to me, that does feel like something where... I'm you know, not putting undue pressure on maintaining that resource moving forward. Um, that is just, a, in my personal like, view, a, a different way of consideration. And I would say the 30000 does go to general operating right now, right? It's not, it's just to, it goes in with everything else. So right. um, again, I don't, I don't want to play, personally, don't want to play hardball. That's not how we want to budget and just would say, like, I don't want to demand an increase, but if there's a way to revisit potentially looking at future years. I mean, that was the first question I asked Tom, is, well, you're asking for more this year, and we're going to be in the exact same place next year. So recognizing it is our responsibility to pay folks equitably, and um, that's the bottom line commitment. And if this is a one-year thing that you can do without harming your asset for the future, um, to me, that's just a different type of consideration. If I could just add that the increases in salary still will not make them equitable. Mm -hmm. yeah. They are still very much less yes. um, than earned by uh, people in other <coughs> libraries. And other departments. And other well. departments. And not for nothing, Tom and I, and ironically Rachel, sorry, are in the welcoming and engaging community cohort with the Vermont League of Cities and Town that's going to survey every town employee about if they feel welcome, included, and respected in the community. <laughs> and I would guess I would just say, like, I, I meant that when I said that it is a priority yeah. for me personally to do that. And some of that is data, yeah. data gathering and collection. And likewise, when I was informed of this, I felt like it was really important to address. But compensation um, is an indication of respect. And right, which is why I'm trying to get us to a path mm -hmm. that makes sure we're all supporting that and why I'm not proposing cutting budget, but I'm also looking to be collaborative with the town around a solution 
if it's not harming your arm to an asset and it's the same type of use that you already used the funds for. So, yeah, and a reminder that we do have an imminent need and goal and that we're not solving all <coughs> of the big picture problems in one decision and in one meeting, right? So there's, there's a, we're not gonna get from A to Z tonight, we're gonna maybe get to C and we have a lot of work collaboratively to do to get to where the town needs to be. So keeping that in mind that that's our goal and if it, and I think it does necessitate more work together versus like, you know, this is pretty new information. And so let's get to where we need to be to have a budget for March. Mike. One question, I probably, it's for Tom. As much as I do agree with you, I think town, town employees, library employees should be equally paid. But also there's the question of sometimes you have to analyze and Tom might know more and Rachel what people do and you have to analyze what someone, you know, just because someone's doing this and someone's doing that, are they compensated at the, at the same level because they're a library employee or a town employee? It really depends on what their responsibilities are. And, you know, I'm totally for someone with the same same response, similar, similar responsibilities getting paid similarly. Same with benefits and such like that. So I have no problem with that. I just have a little more of a problem when we do have a large asset where we're in a fiscal problem that maybe this this is a year that the library can contribute toward that inequity. As we get a little more repetitive, I wanna circle back and see what maybe our next step is in decision making or requests for forward movement. So one thing you could do, and I could print it out quickly, is you could have an executive session now and invite the library commissioners and library director and we can take a look at the salaries and some of the comparables. That would be if, that really was, awesome. if that's desired. Do you want to do it now? Uh, I mean, does that, does that feel? I'm just thinking they're here. Is that yeah. the end of this session? Five, one second. Right now. Uh, does this decision need to be made this evening? Um, it's either this week or next week. Okay. <laughs> Could wait, but probably <clears throat> end of the week. What are you looking at me for? <laughs> You're the one who gives me all these deadlines about when I've got to wrap up. I gave you a deadline and... two weeks ago, and here we sit. So I guess my question end. is: Is the salary? I guess my question is to the board: Is the salary increase the problem? Is the amount the problem, or is it just? Um, not the problem, but the question. Is that going to change the opinions or are there, is there a path A, path B, and path C that we can discuss and then think about moving on forward? Does that, Roger? Yeah, I mean, I thought I heard that uh, with the assurance that uh, we would have every intention of returning to previous levels of uh, the contribution of the trust, uh, that they would be willing to go up to the $45,000. If that's agreeable to everyone, I'm agreed to move forward. Uh, if not, then we do have to resolve the issue. Would do you want to make a motion in that regard to see? I'd like to hear back okay. uh, from the commissioners. I mean, I thought I heard that from the commission. Uh, may, I'm just testing. Is that what I heard? Um. I'm, I'm going to say yes. <laughs> 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 not in the okay. <laughs> um, keeping in mind all of the years that uh, the town has benefited from not paying the people in the library what they should have been paid. I want to just. Number of volunteers. Mm, yeah. And yeah. also a lot of unpaid. I, I agree with that. I, however, will not. I wouldn't put this at jeopardy for that, I guess is my yeah. point. Before. Because the most important thing is that our staff does deserve to be paid at the very least equitably when compared to the other staff of the town. Don't think anyone is saying otherwise. Yeah, I, and, I, and I feel like I've said it, I'm gonna say it again. <laughs> Uh, I will speak on behalf of the board that we agree and we want this to happen and we, if we make this motion and this vote, it is with full intention of doing even better next year. It's, I think the issue is the timing, what's been prepared, 
what the, all the factors are in terms of your budgets, our budgets, resources. Um, there is no dispute about uh, the importance of carrying on the fact finding and making sure that we move forward in the best possible way for everyone. So this is not a debate about whether or not it's deserving to bring equity and respect and pay and compensation to the question. It's just about the, the, the situation in front of us. So um, I'm unsure. At, I'm unsure as to where to go, unless there's a motion or um, Chris, do you have a brief question? Yes, I just Genuinely? want to make a statement. So I heard some information on WDEU this morning, whether it's true or not. I believe it's true because they were talking about the anticipated state increase <coughs> in education costs. For a half a million dollar home, it's an additional thousand dollars for that homeowner. Moving forward, we've got the seventy-one million dollar bond vote that's looming. Ninety-one million. Yeah, no. I, was the, I was at the Wakefield meeting and they said it was 71 million. Okay. Okay. So, I lowered it. Right. Oh, right. Uh, and sure. the reappraisal process that has hit some towns and will be hitting ours soon to, to, to take and move this money into next year's budget, I think you're going to be faced with some more challenges next year. Uh, you know, given we can get through this year at a reasonable level without getting beat on too much, but uh, I think you're, you're speculating that you're going to be able to just make this disappear in the budget next year, but the stock market is doing very well. I, I encourage you to take the money now uh, and make use of it, and you'll recover it as the top stock market continues to move up. So. Okay. I'm just going to comment that by this time next year, we will have a local option tax that we're going to be drawing on. <laughs> okay, I'm going to hold you. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. We love it. How many days are you going to pay for that one? <laughs> Depends on the short term rentals, I guess. Can I just have a minute? <laughs> Roger, you really uh, you picked a good one for to be on Zoom. Throw me in here. <laughs> My parting gift. Yeah, no, um, I appreciate that, and uh, you know, uh, thanks, Danny, for stepping in. <laughs> I'm just giving you a hard time. It's all good. Stepping in is a good word. Yeah. Um, you know, uh, uh, we, we understand that there could even be a gender equity here uh, issue, um, but we're we're trying to solve it, and uh, appreciate the fact that everyone is trying to pull together and, and make this work. Um, Looking at the earnings that the uh, commission has, the trust has earned this year, we're hoping that uh, we can find the solution. Um, and I guess that's that's where we're at. That's where I'm at. <laughs> Thank you. Okay. Um, do you, is there a motion to approve? The Not yet. <laughs> so, is that the there will be a motion that the select board will vote. Okay. On. Um, in the motion, can you somehow include the fact that it would be um, a one-time increase or a one-time something, just so that it's Roger's raising his hand? I don't know. Okay. <laughs> We're anticipating it to go back. Uh, okay. I mean, we can state it as an intent, can't we, Tom? If it's in the minute, if it's in the minute, that's an indication. Go ahead. Uh, yes. Yes, okay. uh, I'll move that uh, the select board support the, the budget as written uh, with the understanding that this will be a one-time request from the Library Commission to increase their contribution to $45,000 for this year, and that uh, will make every effort to reduce it back to previous levels in the coming year. I second that motion. <laughs> we have a motion and a second. Further discussion from the board? All those in favor? Uh, aye. 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 Any opposed or abstentions? The motion carries. Thank you so much, all of you. Um, I just want to say yeah. uh, thank you for your time, um, and also, I feel like we had to ask. We could just give it away. We appreciate, as Tom said, you doing your jobs, and also, you know, look forward to this year, you know, ongoing 
work together. <laughs> Thank, you. Thank you. What a turnout from the library. Look at this. And don't charge late fees, or I'm going to need them. <laughs> hmm. We don't charge late fees. <laughs> no, we love it. <laughs> Deeply appreciate it as someone who uses things. As somebody together. who is Regina late on my own books. Oh, um, we have an enforcement we can charge late fees. <laughs> No, I'm gonna, I'm gonna ask you for a big raise. Mm -hmm. <laughs> <laughs> and then my kids, you know, they just check out five at a time, and, and then I've got to round them up and it's hard. I do that too. <laughs> I mean, yeah, my kid does that too. My kid, I mean, me. All right, as we kerfuffle away, we can continue conversation in the lobby, which would be wonderful, just as cold in here as it is out there. And we shall move forward onto special articles. And um, Tom, are you leading the discussion on this? Well, so we what have, um, it's really contained in the draft warning. So it's, oh, okay. really, it's really one and the same really okay. conversation. <laughs> so my understanding is every single, and we're starting really at article 10, which is the second page, and then going down to the bottom. Every single request Karen received was the exact same as 2023, with the exception of Article 19. Uh, the American Legion um, went and got the petitions filled and, and the requisite number of signatures yeah. uh, to be on the ballot. So you don't have the option of, of changing that amount or removing it. Mm -hmm. Um, but every other one is the same. The, the conversation last year really centered around the senior center and how much of the increase should be in the budget versus as a special article. Um, the, the only other thing I'd point out is there's been an informal rule, I don't know for how long, but at least for a few years, that anything under $2,000 is lumped into Article 10. And, and maybe you want to revisit that number. And if you don't, that's entirely your business. I'm no opinion whatsoever on. And if you want to disbundle Article 10 and have separate questions for each one, <laughs> I'm, I'm exhausted. I'm already. there at March 5th for the day. <laughs> questions, uh, Alyssa? Um, is there a reason Article 15 is highlighted? Oh, sorry. No, sorry, not that one. I thought it was the, it's the senior center. It's the question about how much we put in the budget. I do have last year's, and it looks like we have 20 in the budget, which would not end, add up to their 39. Did I, am I reading the wrong line? 32, yeah, five? It, it's in a different area of the budget. It's, um, it's, is it in public health? I've tried, tried to find it. No, it's in general government. Senior center. <laughs> <laughs> I'll have to dig it up. But. It's, it's no, it is. I have Jeff bookmarks in mine, but I don't have mine. Historical, downstreet, ambulance. But we'll make sure it's at the requested amount. Oh, yeah, no, but I guess in terms of the division question, I guess it's the other. Um, I, having attended town meeting, would support raising the informal threshold of Article 10 <laughs> if they are all the same amount for purposes of packaging. Um, is there, this would be a moderator question, I assume someone can pull out an item. I'm thinking of like our consent agenda where you essentially, it's a town meeting consent agenda. Mm -hmm. Here's the 15 Especially million like things and if you want to discuss one, I guess anyone can make it. Um, but if they're not controversial and the same amounts and relatively modest amounts, I personally support this, Do you want it to raise it, Alyssa? Everything in Article 10 is under... Under 2,000. Under, under, under under two, under not two, at under two. two, under, under two. 2, yeah. So all the 2,000s are still there. Yeah. Are, are yeah. But some are new. Um, <coughs> what are you proposing, oh. Alyssa? Yeah. I was saying if there was, I am supportive of moving more things into Article 10 where they're all read and passed as a package, given that I think collectively they do all end up passing for the relatively modest amounts and as opposed to having to go through the formality of, Yeah, that's what I was trying to ask as well. I would say, we could, I mean, we could try 2,500. I guess my only note is I think informally in the past we've said things that are new mm -hmm. or different. Um, 
still remain as individual articles to facilitate easier discussion. Um, so I would propose expanding Article 10 to include all appropriations of up to $2,500 for organizations not requesting an increase that have passed at subsequent town meeting and are not a new well, appropriation. Was that a motion? Other, uh, if it needs to be. Oh. Um, just a sec, you have, I didn't write it down because I didn't know it was a motion. It, and, and let's that, just um, let's keep it as a proposed suggestion. I think there were some more board questions, and then I'll get to the public um, just shortly. So I know, Ann, you had your hand up as well. Go ahead, Mike. I would just disagree with that. Just for the sake of, I think that small requests are small requests, and I would just I would just spe spend a little bit of time. I, I've always been a proponent of hearing from an organization of what what they do, and if it's something more, I I like that two hundred. If it's under 2,000, it gets grouped. You know, if there's gonna keep on being a creep, I don't mind them telling what they do at town meeting. I think that's a very healthy thing to do. You know, I just don't really like, it's my, my personal opinion. Anything uh, else? Oh, can go ahead. I'm not gonna echo Mike here, um, but there's, you know, there's a few names of organizations in Article 10 that sort of speak for themselves, right? Um, and then there's names of organizations outside of Article 10 that speak for themselves. And I think an increase this time sort of just makes sense because I don't see anything on here that, like, I don't read American Legion and I'm like, oh, what do they do? You know, not as the example for the increase, but um, I think having to trudge through every organization and what they do at town meeting might seem, might come off as tedious. Um, <coughs> so I, I support the increase. And we could also choose another amount as well when a motion is ready to be made. Um, Anne, you had your hand up. Uh, I kind of agree that, that it is nice to hear from the various companies and organizations that are requesting funds from us. Maybe not every year, but, and it's hard for some of them to get to all the town meetings that they're requesting funding from. But I do think it is incumbent uh, for the members of the community who attend town meeting to hear uh, what, yes, they put a letter into the town uh, report, but, uh, you know, just, but the other thing that then happens at town meeting is if we're requesting every want to speak to a to line. Uh, there isn't a representative there, and then Tom Connolly gets up and speaks for them. So it's an, eh, <laughs> you're damned if you do it. Or damned if you do it. <laughs> They're not wrong, and thank you, Alyssa. I guess I don't disagree with Mike's point at all. I, I guess this comes to our broader conversation, which also happens in budgeting. Was that how we got our 2023 library update? Because I'd love a less contentious venue in the future. And so I, I don't dispute that. Like, I would love to hear from these. I would say of this list, I mean, I'm trying to think of the amount that had a representative at town meeting last year. And maybe it's the incentive. I guess I have a broader question about, like, should we structure a town meeting differently to facilitate those updates? Um, and maybe it is holding everyone to 20 separate articles so they can hear. Um, I'm just thinking I, I, Steve did often speak for a lot, candidly, at least in my limited time in Waterbury. Uh, oh, I'm gonna let Roger uh, speak first and I'll come back to you. Sure. Thank you. Go ahead, Roger. Uh, yeah, I mean, I think one thing we could do would be to uh, ask anyone that is in uh, part of Article 10 to come up and speak for let's say up to two minutes, uh, 
whether we can run through them without having to hold a vote on each and every uh, thing. As uh, Alyssa noted, almost everything passes. Um, I think the, the Legion question could be uh, an interesting debate uh, at town meeting this year. Uh, Certainly, uh, you know, an upgrade to LED lighting is, is uh, certainly a, a great thing for them. Whether they could have gone to Efficiency Vermont or found other ways of financing this, uh, I don't know. Um, but, uh, you know, uh, I guess uh, my experience has been having to put everyone, each one of those to a vote does slow the meeting down and make it a little bit of a challenge uh, for participants. Thank you. Mike, you have to know. Yeah, th this is a little bit about, not about the $2,000, but about our newest special article. Not that I'm very much for the Legion. You know, they're requesting, you know, 4125. I'm more concerned about potential, we're seeing potential creep on, is the next year the Masons going to come in? Is the next year, you know, different groups? And it's just, getting to a point where fiscally it's going to become more and more of a problem. You know, you know, everyone, you know, it's mother apple pie and Chevrolet, you know, people, all these things do well, but, uh, you know, and I, I, I would love to hear, especially, you know, that's something from the Legion is what they need town money for versus, you know, you know, that they hold the survived on their own fundraising. Well, they submitted a petition, so it's in there. So the details are there. And in addition, we did say anything that's new is separate, so they'll, you know, they're invited and hopefully speak, but again, it's not up to us, it'll be up to the voters, so. Right. Um, it's pretty generic. Um, let's talk about the, light, the LED lighting, and they give the approximate costs and why. The, what the request is exactly for. So it was thirty-nine thousand total last year for all the special articles. Oh, there you go. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> I'm saying I found it in the town report, but I mean, um, I yeah, I hear you, Mike. I think it's beyond our control, especially right. for this it, it, year. Right. Totally. You know, if they put in a petition, they can. Yeah. Uh, the voters uh, get to. Right. The voters say ultimately have. What's going to say? Oh, that's why? The line. Thank you. Um, really are there no. further questions about the special articles and I guess the warning, we haven't read through the whole warning, but special articles and or are there any motions for changes and then we can look back at the whole warning? No, I'll propose we keep the senior air center the same because they're asking for the same amount as last year and we'll do it in the same structure. Okay, so we don't need to do anything formal. We'll just leave it as is since there's no changes. Okay. So in the end, we're keeping it uh, 2,000 and under was in Article 10. Technically, it's under 2,000, not 2,000 and under. Because okay. so. there are a few that are 2K One, even. Two. I think it's just three. I guess it's two. two. Yeah, oh, I was seeing if we moved it. <laughs> oh, yeah. If you moved it's it just by a penny. Yeah, a dollar. Two. Well, yeah, a penny. <laughs> um, I mean, I'd be fine with it, but I don't care enough to go through the whole discussion all over again. So okay. <laughs> I'm happy to leave it as it. it. big long enough so we can get the, uh, get the lunch served. <laughs> um, okay. And continuing on in the same, looking through the rest of the warning. Um, article I want to highlight is Article 8, on the, towards the bottom of the first page. The language was uh, provided uh, by Bond Council, so we know it's, it's good, legally approved language. Um, I want to point out that when Gary came before the board um, six or seven months ago, the number was 370000 I did a double check on the number, and that remains the price for the truck. But... Um, I bumped it to 380. As it turns out, different trucks have different hose fittings. I would have assumed that was that a, a fire truck is a fire truck, whether it's in Waterbury, Vermont, or Timbuktu. Um, they have a set of adapters they want to buy for the truck, so this would <laughs> add to the cost a little bit. It's essentially part of the truck, so I thought it belonged here. Um, so the number went up a little bit. <clears throat> but yeah, that was a, a shock to me to learn that. In fact, they're different. Is it like 
different manufacturers of different hoses or hose fittings? I think different, different manufacturers and different, mostly different vintage. It's, it's a little bit okay. mind You would just assume yeah. that things in that industry would be right, exactly. 100% yeah. standardized no matter what. Um, <laughs> but apparently not quite 100%. Yeah, it's like the Apple charger conundrum. conundrum. A little bit. Yeah, right. <laughs> um, questions or <coughs> comments? I think it's part of, you know, if you, if you buy a truck from E1, <laughs> like, they want you to buy your next truck from E1. I just want to ask Karen, if, if we could have an email sent out to all the special article folks, including the ones in exit 10, just saying we would like to, in the event questions come up, that you have a representative available at, at the meeting. Short and sweet. I can send an email. I know it may not <laughs> yeah. go anywhere, but it's worth, you know, at least saying. Is this an appropriate time for me to tell you that Green Mountain Transit has neither invoiced me or sent me um, a report for 2023? <laughs> yeah. And I, I can barely get a hold of that. Cool. I thought, what, we just don't pay them. They, have uh, they haven't invoiced me, so I haven't paid them. Yeah. Well, they sent an appropriation letter, yeah. but they haven't been paid for last year. And I'm... I meant to document all the emails I sent, but it's it's I numerous. Know most of them. So I can send it, and most of them will respond, Mike. Right. And and this would be a good time while we're talking about this, maybe not interrupting the fire truck conversation, but we need to talk about the community band. I need a consensus whether I'm inviting them or not inviting them. Um, and Other one eligible. of the one of the sorry, Roger. Uh, Pledge of Allegiance. Pledge of Allegiance. We don't need to talk we about already the talked Pledge about of Allegiance. This. That's already that's already been covered, so we don't need to discuss that, but. The, the community band is one of the special articles, so right. the voters do provide them typically. Um, you can so send the I, same email to them as to the rest so of the special I'm articles. Is if I'm going to send that email, my am proposal. I inviting the whole band, or am I just inviting a representative to speak? I think if you send my yeah. recommendation, though I'm open to everyone's opinion, is that if you send the same email you send to everyone else, and they respond and ask about uh, additional, you can bring that to... Okay, a discussion. So to be asked. Okay, that's fine. I mean, I'm I, I'm yeah, one voice. That works but yeah, that's what we've talked yeah, about in the past. It's continuing okay. with tradition. Okay. Maybe the saxophonist. <laughs> yeah. Can we hand select Just who the we one, would like the to come? Just the solo saxophonist. <laughs> 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 That'll be great. Um. Yes. Uh, yeah, and. We got it. Do we know who the moderator's going to be? Um, <coughs> to some extent, yes. Okay. Yes. Thank you. <laughs> Has a Keith Wallace Award winner been selected? That uh, is going to be agenda. in our next agenda. agenda. Okay. So let's, is there more on either the warning and or special articles? Discussion? Questions? Not needs? Not Excellent. So we'll move on to... Wait, wait, ooh, the, so I'm wait, just taking the draft off this or signing it next week? No changes. What's the email? Is that what you're telling me? Yes. Okay. No changes. <laughs> Can you? Is that great? Yeah, <laughs> this is going to make sure I understand. Can we provide chat? Okay. Just, I would just form yeah. it instead of me. It should be Michael Barr. Michael Barr. Oh, okay. I can make that change. I actually used last year's as a template, so. I would like you to change mine from Danielle to Danny. Okay. I'm just kidding. I'm just kidding. Oh, okay. I just, I don't care. But I don't know who that is. Now's the time. <laughs> That's um, my wait, wait, thing. wait. We also have other business discussion of town meeting day format and consideration of alternatives. Where is that? Clear. Oh, it's lurking right above the date. Oh, oh there it is. Last year, so oh, so should be clear. I'm happy to do it. Again, we should have an intentional Thank you conversation. Good catch, though. That's so. probably just a holdover from last yeah. year. Yeah. So good catch. It was because we couldn't do it as an article because it could become binding. Yeah. I, the <laughs> thing I just said to Danny under my breath is, can we provide child, child care? care? I don't know if there's a history of the town ever doing that or the children's room did. I spoke to the children's room about that last year and they couldn't. I can't recall why. I can ask them again. Okay. I feel like it would be worth. I think we all acknowledge that town meeting is not as accessible of a venue, and I. I it may have no utilization, but I guess personally I would sleep better if I knew we at least tried to mm -hmm. do something direct provide child care. There's rec camp. option. Rec camp. There's school rec camp, but that's oh. not dropping. It's I think, 
think yeah, that's I think, a reasonable. I think Lisa has a hand up. Oh, Lisa, thank you. Um, just the National Honor Society chapter at Harwood is doing child care for the school fund uh, community meetings. Mm. Um, that's a day off from school for Harwood. Um, you could potentially contact the advisor for National Honor Society and because that's one of the things they do is community service. So if they had a request, they might be able to have a few of the students volunteer to work at every time you need to child care. Yeah, yeah that's, that would raise the question where, but it's worth investigating. Yeah. 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 School in like session? That. Yeah. Oh, no, sorry. Town meeting day. We don't have school. It's February break. They could they could do it at our rec building. Right. Well, the rec building already has our rec camp in it, huh? Right. What hours? So the school Full day. could possibly Full have day. a classroom that the National Honor, Honor Society could use. <laughs> yeah. Well, if it's the district's National Honor Society, I'm sure we could work with the school on that. Somehow. I think by consensus, Karen is going to reach out to potential child care providers prior to the next meeting, and we'll finalize that when we sign the final warning. Thanks. Thanks, Karen. I'll see what I can do. Can publicize. We can find peoples, and then we'll see if we can find a place, and we'll go from there. This room will be empty. This office will be closed. So Board games all day. We can run up and down the halls. Go here. to Dr. O. <laughs> Sledding. Right, I'm in. I'll see what I can Reading do. I can't wait town meeting. I'm going to be at rec day camp. Um, <laughs> I, okay. Next meeting agenda. Highway <laughs> mileage. Um, oh, highway mileage. Oh, I skipped that because we, because I skipped it. <laughs> highway <laughs> mileage certificate. Did Woody look at this? <laughs> <laughs> it's, my, it's Woody's memo or yeah. post-it note. Oh, yeah. Thanks. It's an annual form we have to complete. We get about $120,000 in a typical year from the state, um, and it's based on the mileage uh -oh, there. It's here. Why do you want oh. to sign it? I, no, no, I'm no, I was telling Kane because he was scrambling to see if he lost a piece of paper. Um, well, while we're doing mileage, can we talk about the next agenda? <laughs> Chair agrees. Yes. Oh, well, I just want everyone to be able to. Okay. And the mileage did change a tiny bit because we paid a little river road. So. Is that the post that note that it changed like that? Yeah. I squinted and read half of that. <laughs> Thank you. Um, okay. Um, yes, Kane. My comment was going to be because we were we heard from the uh, housing task force, obviously, mm -hmm. and we will be looking at next next week. We'll be looking at another issue surrounding the housing task force. The appointment for, of someone. Do we want to move a um, vote on their proposal to next week, or do we want to push that off? Um, may I speak to that? Uh, Joe had come in and spoken to me earlier, or excuse me, late last week in anticipation of tonight and asked me to get on another agenda. I told him that this one was already jam-packed. You know, we have dog ordinance, we had well, what I thought would be a potentially long discussion about the warning, which turns out paid off. <laughs> um, but anyway, I did, I did place a, a placeholder for him on the 1st February. Maybe. Got it, okay. So if, if that, I can move it. But he was—he seemed very comfortable with that. So. Sure. Great. Thank you, Karen. Thanks, Karen. Um, Mike Keith Wallace Award discussion is on there. Um, and I—I I, as a note, Karen was just talking to Lisa, and I'd love to change the language of dog ordinance to what it is officially, which I think is animal control, animal control. ordinance. Okay. Yes. Um, just to be, you know, sure. all encompassing. We just need a majority to select board on the mileage, right? Mm -hmm. Yeah, we're fine with that. And if if we have time, we can have an agenda item about the tax penalty. Danny and I have traded some emails and had some conversation with some ideas. Were you asking for that? Um, yes, I think as if I don't know if Roger, if you guys are meeting before next meeting or not about the agenda. Um, but when you uh, sort out the times, if there seems to be a, a slot for adding uh, the tax penalty, re. Uh, conversation. Yeah, I don't see any problem with that. I know. Okay. 
Um, <coughs> um, under EFUD, the last item, Neyland Flats Mobile Home Park, can we can we add, can we modify that to say Neyland Flats Mobile Home Park and fire protection? Mm. Anything else for next meeting agenda or for future items or questions? Excellent. Uh, then I'm going to, oh, wait. One thing. I would like to take up at some future point. You know, it's nothing that has to be done. Maybe it's something for the in incoming select board. But Chris Vianne's suggestion of having like a community kind of get get together, you know, kind of a big potluck or something like that. I think I think that has a lot of merit. People get to you know, I used to walk down Main Street and I used to know a lot of people. Now I feel like I'm almost a strange not a stranger in my own town, but I don't know nearly the amount of people that I did at one point. And I think at least it, it engages some people to get for neighbors to get to know each other, and I think it, it, it would be a good thing. They can come to the event on uh, February 10th, everyone. Community event. Well, um, do you want to put that in, uh, do you want to put kind of a, uh, a select board organized community event on the parking lot yeah. for future? I will say there has also been interest you can in come the hang out at the res with me. I know everybody. Isn't that what this? <laughs> I'll introduce you. No, I know all the people. No, no, Robert, you don't want to get some Oh, like meeting, not hang out. Mm -hmm. Yes, yes. Yeah. More, more business. Okay. That's fun. Yeah, got it. Um, other parking lot or agenda items before we executive session? Um, Anne, are you raising your hand? Okay. Uh, one other thing, uh, it's something Alyssa reminded me of last week. Uh, we <laughs> used to have uh, a community thing before town meeting where every organization in the community was invited to have a table and sort of push their wares or whatever they were doing. Uh, so it was kind of a community gathering. It was held at the gym and at the school. And um, it was kind of fun to see what other organizations are in town and are happening, because not everybody is aware of all of the different groups that are going on around this community. So it's too late to plan for that this year, but keep it in mind for next year. Thanks, Anne. Yeah. And you can ask Alyssa what else she had in mind. <laughs> Thank you. There was a couple thousand dollars in the planning budget for several years in a row for a community fair. I think it was in February. Okay. Is it like a craft fair almost? No, no, no. No, like uh, the it's boards like, and commissions. Like, oh, oh, gotcha. The planning commission, like organizations. the DRV, the you know, Rotary, the uh, yeah, Garden Club, all the community organizations kind of came together and people could come and see what was going on. Cool. Yeah. I should find some newspaper articles that were done on it. It was every other year because it was such a big undertaking. Yeah. If I remember correctly, mm -hmm. it would be at the school. At Probably been yeah. 15 years. Yeah, I was going to say, it was before my yeah. tenure here. Well, it's almost sure. semi happening sort of a little bit at the like Leaf Energy Fair. You see a lot of the different. It's a similar vibe to the Leaf Fair. You've been to the Leaf Fair. It's a similar kind of thing. There's some tables for all the different All right, I'll rec Well, wait, well, see ya. while we're still in public session, I was, I've been reading this, and I just wanted to say this aloud for the community is that the most circulated uh, category of books this year was picture books. Uh, and then the top picture book was a title, I Eat, <laughs> I eat Poop. I've never read that book and I look forward to it. I, I need to pick I that up. I Eat Poop <laughs> is the top rated oh, book I this year. I Eat, not I Eat. I Eat. I Eat. It was yeah. written by my brother-in-law. Really took me <laughs> through a loop there. Wow, great. Um, Heard that? Do we? I can't wait. 
I'm thinking about town meeting, so this I was gonna phrase this word, but like, well, never mind. Yes. I'm just thinking of like this library thing. It's right. like hybrid between Well, we continue to talk fair. about this of like, right. how do we get this more often? Do more engaging yeah. presentation at town meeting besides here's a pile of spreadsheets that is the budget. But um, maybe it's a wall of these. Like like when you go to the hotel and all the brochures of things you could right. do. Right, so I'm saying like, in, is it a, in, in absence of, of a table, yeah. if Karen is inviting representatives, a, do a we want to say or a brochure? I would do, I would do Make the infographic. I love it, yeah. I, you have voting. <laughs> is it still workable if we did like three or four tables somewhere for folks to leave material at town meeting? We sort of do have that. Um, but different the lobby. ways. In, oh, the, yeah, yeah, okay, yeah. So the lobby would be the, oh, yeah, and the girls' guns are normally there with cookies and things. Perfect. Stop for the cookies, pick up uh, a brochure. Like, uh, um, oh, Duncan. Duncan stopped by a couple weeks ago. Yeah. I think very cursory asked if he could set up an easel or something in the lobby. Yeah. And that's my question of if she's inviting folks anyway, do we at least have a thing saying we can provide materials? I know, like, Rachel came last year to town meeting yeah. just to be there, but, um, Yeah. Anyway. Yeah? Can we add that to the invitation? If you have a, uh, what, like an annual report or a highlights of 2023 or a brochure of accomplishments? Um, it is a space question, though. I think we would say right. that. It's only if it's really I'm feasible. not going to go collect them. No, yeah, no, 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 no. We will set up a table, and they can. You could say drop them off at Put them down on the table. Morning. Yeah. Okay. No one needs to man it and or. And I can come early to. Yeah, I can too, actually. Support that. Yeah, I could too. That's fine. If you but have there is a space that there's only so much room in that little lobby. Right. Right. So that's my. But if, if we had two eight foot tables and nothing bigger than a eight and a half by eleven, that would well, be Well, if goal. you think back last year, there was um, a health fair that took place downstairs yeah. in the cafeteria. The one of the main organizers of that was one of the nurses at the school. She no longer works there. I haven't heard. Mm -hmm. anything from anyone picking up that process <laughs> and continuing it. So it may have been the first and last annual health fair. Right. <laughs> um, but anyway, uh, we could, well, I don't think that the cafeteria is necessarily the best place to put, mm -hmm. put uh, brochures. You want people to see them as they come in. But, um, but there's a space down there as well. So anybody could come and if they wanted to discuss stuff with the public. That's what that health fair was for. So there were people like, I don't know if Washington County Mental Health made it, but there was invites out to various organizations. I think, yeah, people. keeping this very, very simple of like, nobody needs to stand there, no one needs right. to engage. It's just like, would you like to see what the library is doing, what the Legion is doing? <coughs> Pick up a piece of paper or mm -hmm. don't, mm -hmm. as long as there's room for a couple tables, but. Is yeah. anyone interested in doing lunch after the meeting? Um, I talked to the senior center about it, um, but I specifically talked to Maureen White, um, who's the treasurer, <coughs> so she was going to have to talk to the board. Um, okay. And the only thing she did say that she would recommend to the board if they do it is that this year she would recommend doing it by donation only. I don't know why, maybe the money collection was an issue for them. I really donation. can't remember. Really? I thought they always liked it. And the Grange always did it. I think that was a big fundraiser for them. Yeah, I think I, my big recollection, I think it's always been the senior center, right? That's what Carla told me. Um, Last year was the senior center. But I think they made it like 12 bucks, and then they had to give change out, and it was this kind of a nuisance for them. So I don't know. That's just, I'm just sharing what she said. They would do it this year by donation only. That No price listed. Just give a donation and get lunch. So we'll see. It, I have the question out to them, Roger. Okay. Yeah. I think we should probably take them up on it if they're willing to do it. Yeah. Oh, yeah. Yes, thank you, Bill. Um, and I'm not here because of this, but as you know, I'm on crew. I had a conversation with Tom last week, and I know who is going to talk about it for me tomorrow. And I have mixed feelings about this. Um, I talked to Tom and asked if there was going to be any funding for crew. And he told me that um, he submitted to FEMA uh, uh, information about all the volunteer hours that have been 
that have been uh, worked, and I don't know, I think you said something like $33,000 or something like that. Okay. I'm just wondering for those, so Tom said if that money comes in, his plan would be to give it to Kirk. Well, to go to the select board. My thought process was that was not town expenditures. That was pure community volunteer hours that yeah. will pay us. So maybe give it back to the community in a similar manner. And I think that's a good idea. But I also know how some people feel about there was nothing budgeted and something comes in and you just pass it off to somebody else. So would it be, and I'm, this is a question, not a demand. Would it be reasonable to put on your warning $35,000 to crew uh, and conditioned upon receipt of money from FEMA? And then if it comes in, it goes, and it's clear, we know that we have it. Either a future select board doesn't have to agree to it. Um, if you don't say any, if, I, if we don't say anything about it and the money comes in, then there's going to be have, to have to be a conversation. So you don't have to decide it tonight. You're going to sign your warning next week. Mm -hmm. But it's just something that I thought about two minutes ago. <laughs> about Thanks, Bill. Thanks a lot. What would crew do with the money? Well, we're raising money you know, to try to help people recover from the flood. So you know, paying for labor to uh, fix people's homes, to help people who need to maybe move their electrical panel, their boilers, or there's a litany of things, kind of litany of things yeah. that, we're, that we're trying to do. I think we've raised somewhere in the seventy-five dollars to $100,000 range right now. One of them was one big grant from the Community Foundation. So anyway, just a thought. Thank you. Um, any follow-up on that or leave that for next week with the warning? Okay. Tom, do you, do you have thoughts on that? Do you think you um, want to bind us, bind us to it? Or? <coughs> it's up to you. My, I guess my only thought is the challenge with the FEMA money is you don't know when it's going to come in. Um, and I just actually, on uh, Thursday or Friday, re signed uh, the first, it's technically a grant, um, the flood that, the flood of July is subdivided into essentially different categories. One of the categories is called emergency measures, which is what you did before the flood. So we get some reimbursement, you know, seven or eight grand for that. Um, that's the first one that's been finalized. There's some other real easy projects, you know, Fisk and Winooski Street and fixing a culvert in Greg Hill Road that they've had for months, um, and I'm just waiting on paperwork. The volunteer hours, there's a lot more than $30,000 worth. What my FEMA rep has said is that um, to the extent Sign Up Genius was used, that if someone said they're going to show up at 9 and, and volunteer until noon, we've got a name, we've got some documentation mm -hmm. that makes sense. Um, the rest of it, which was just tracked via Excel by some of the, mm -hmm. some of the volunteers, they, they think that's not as strong. So, that, so what I... What my rep has said is he thinks the volunteer hours using Sign Up Genius will be reimbursed, which is a good clue for the future about how we want to do things. The rest of it, um, even he won't bring to his higher ups at this stage. So like the 40 hours a week of Alyssa, me, and Liz for three weeks, give or take, yeah. irrelevant in that count? At this point, we're yeah. still fighting that fight. Um, but he's also made it clear that First comes reimbursement for emergency measures, then for capital projects, and then for the big debris cleanup, and then volunteer hours. There's a claim for um, other entities that volunteer their service to help us. Um, there's a claim eventually that will be for my time. All that comes seemingly much later. Mm. So I have no objection to, to promising the crew or whoever the the $30,000 in FEMA money, I just can't tell you if it's going to come at all or even if they signed off on it tomorrow, when we'll get the money. Mm -hmm. Just okay. so that's understood. Mm -hmm. Okay. Question? Well, it complicates. I guess I'm saying like I have 
question about the cash flow. Do we wait till it comes in? I was wondering about Roger. I haven't done a deep dive on your edit. Is there a Never way to acknowledge it? it? And then the question was for crew: Are you doing a report, or have you thought about it? Did we ask you? Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. um, they? We have, I haven't thought about it. Nobody yeah, but it, I'm just it. I'm just thinking about no, if, as the community's long-term recovery committee, at, at a minimum, is it worthwhile to share that you exist your membership? Mm -hmm. I mean, when I did the transportation, whatever subcommittee with Barb the year before, I think we put a one pager in. Um, so at a minimum, maybe it makes sense to include that. And then- So Karen, when's the thing? <laughs> Thanks. It was last week. Well, last Friday. <laughs> I know Liz is gonna kill me. She came in going, oh, can you see if you can get a final answer on funding and instead we have created homework. So this is like, oh, for two, but um, anyway, I'm, if we want Well, if we have a warning explicit. sign next Monday, then the earliest I can send a draft to the printer is Tuesday. So, okay. um, this weekend. We think that yes. This weekend. So I'll get my stuff to you Wednesday. <laughs> <laughs> we'll staple so, it in. Um, yeah. I mean, the obvious, obviously, the longer I wait, the more stressed I get about getting the books on time. So, um, but we all, you know, I can't send it until the warning's done. So that's Monday night. Yeah. Okay. Do we want it on the warning? Do is there a strong opinion on putting it in the warning for this town meeting? Roger. Yeah, I mean, I think that that was the intention. Uh, so I'd say contingent on receipt of funds that we would put it in. We would. <coughs> so that's the intent. We can draft an article for it and just have it for next week. Okay. And that's the consensus. Oh, I was going to say, I don't want to complicate anything. <laughs> but I'm going to. But I'm going to. Um, as far as I know, it was volunteer hours. It's coming in from FEMA, right? It's not something that we're asking the taxpayers to front. Right. So it is a decision right. by the select board what we do with those funds. I don't think it needs to be on the warning for the town meeting. I think we all agree it does not need to be. Oh, okay. okay. Um, yeah. I guess in it's the just spirit of we extra think two thousand dollars should stand up and say something if it's thirty thousand dollars we're planning to do something with. In some ways, it's a good excuse, right? But those are taxpayer dollars. Fair. I mean, it's all. Thank you, Chris. I will also. I mean, I will also say that. Um, <laughs> You're correct. I'd be shocked if the money comes in before the summer. I would not be shocked if we're having the same conversation next year in anticipation <laughs> of the funds. I wouldn't either. Mm -hmm. In which case, it's more complicated. Oh, what did people just forget? Uh, I, yeah, I don't feel strongly. I think if it feels like they could come in before town meeting next year, if there's a possibility of it, 50-50, then in the sake of extra transparency it lets we can draft some language that says in the event of okay. it will go to yeah, i don't they, imagine that what creating if, a kerfuffle what if they say no well that's i mean that yeah. I'm, that's what do we do with it then is my yeah. concern but keep it yeah, yeah. i guess yeah. Yeah. Sure. Just keep it. Yeah. and then we make our own line item doing the same thing in 2020 and it is a good way for crew to stand up i do think like yeah. there's i mean i I think there's a some. Venn diagram of folks who don't know the organization exists or what they're doing who might be at town meeting. So. Mm -hmm. Agree. Okay. okay. Consensed. So. What else do we want to talk about before we go into executive session? We just got so much good stuff. No? Okay, great. I want to go back over the line. I would love some help with moving us into executive session. Is it for personal? Sorry, it's contractual. Contract. Contract. Oh, look, you oh, got you it. Yay! Thanks, right. Tom. <laughs> Are you checking me to find that? You always make our executive session. I know it is traditional. I know. I would like to. I would like to adopt the berry one, which is you just say for findings. Um, Put that on the parking lot. Okay. So first, I move to find that premature general public knowledge would clearly place the public body at a. Yes. Yeah, so. See, it's so much more complicated when you read it from the thing. Sorry, Karen, I'm starting again. Um, I move to find that premature public knowledge of a pending contract would clearly place the town of Waterbury at a substantial disadvantage. So second? Second. I'll start it. Everyone seconded it. Uh, for the discussion, all in favor? 
Aye. Aye. Any opposed or abstentions? And then I move to enter executive session for the purpose of discussion of contracts and invite the municipal manager. Second. Any further discussion? All in favor? Aye. 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 Objections? I'm just going to print.